I'm going to be in 1 Kings chapter 13, and I'm going to be looking at this young prophet here and talk about the trouble with the young prophet. So in 1 Kings 13, you see King Jeroboam, who is king of Israel, after the dividing of the kingdom, he has already set up a false religion to compete with any type of pure religion that may be going on in Judah. He set up an altar and made two golden calves. But in chapter 13, there is a, a young prophet who is sent to cry against King Jeroboam's false religion. So I want to use this chapter to talk about the trouble with the young prophet. And the first thing you see with him is that he's puffed up in his knowledge. In 1 Kings 13, 1 through 3, he, it seems he could be a little bit puffed up in his knowledge. 1 Kings 13, 1 through 3, it says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born into the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and the men's bones shall be burned upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, their altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. So he's given the prophecy, and it comes to pass. And see, when you've got a King James Bible, you know you've got the right scripture. And you know that it's coming to pass. You can get puffed up in your knowledge. So you can imagine he's cocky with his doctrines. And what, what the young prophet said did come to pass. He wasn't a false prophet. He knew that he had what thus saith the Lord. So the young prophet has the truth. Just like... You, a King James Bible believer, you know you have the truth. You know you have what thus saith the Lord. But sometimes you let it puff you up. Just like 1 Corinthians 8, 1, where it says, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And people are actually more concerned with how much you care than they are with how much you know. And honestly... The average Christian doesn't know enough about the Bible to even be impressed with what you know. Uh, when you start talking about the Bible, you, th you think that you look so, so smart and stuff. They're just looking at you like you're talking in Japanese or something. But the young prophet here is much more, most likely much more impressed with himself than they are with him. King Jeroboam, he's, he's godless. He doesn't even get right after this really he's not impressed with the young prophet and what he knows and most people aren't impressed with you and what you know and you're actually deceived just for thinking that you know something in galatians 6 3 it says for if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing he deceiveth himself You know, and Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8, 2, And if a man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if you have some doctrine, that's great. It is a weapon. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, it talks about how the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You know, the word is your weapon. However, it's not, it isn't a weapon to hurt people. It's a weapon to hurt the forces of darkness and the false doctrine it isn't my job to straighten all the other people out but rather to to edify the saints you know like it says in ephesians 4 12 ephesians 4 and verse 12 We'll look at verse 11, Ephesians 4, 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So first and foremost, you use the word to edify the saints, not trying to just bulldoze everybody. 
it doesn't edify anyone to start a ministry of running down everyone else's ministry. Simply because they teach a few things differently than I do. And many times, the young King James Bible believer forgets this. I'm not saying necessarily the guy in 1 Kings 13, the young prophet there forgot it. But most likely he did because I think a lot of young Bible believers forget that. I, th I think that the young prophet was cocky with his doctrines and conceited in his calling. Now, the young prophet is a real prophet. He's truly called. You know, 1 Kings 13, 1 called him a man of God. He truly was of God. It described how he came by the word of the Lord. So he was really sent by God. Maybe you're really called. Maybe you're really sent. So, he's really called, he's really sent. But there's some people who are really called and really sent, and they get corrupted by certain people. Certain big shot pastors take them under their wing. Or some flashy evangelist guy who's seen as some big time celebrity. Especially those who take pride in the title man of God and just like in Matthew 23 7 in Matthew 23 and verse 7 it says talking about the Pharisees they love greetings in the markets and to be called of men rabbi rabbi but but be not ye called rabbi for one is your master even Christ and all ye are brethren so you, you see Pharisees love the flashy titles they love to be called certain things. And a lot a lot of these big timers, they'll get these younger guys under their wings and they'll make the, the younger guys just like them, kind of conceited in their calling. Even if it is subconsciously, the young Bible believer will begin to see himself as the man of God. G-A-W-D. As they, that's the way they pronounce it. And they begin to make everyone in the pew feel like they are on a lower level spiritually. Because they get conceited in their calling. And the young pastor or just Bible believer can make himself become out of touch and unreachable to the congregation. As if he's way up on a podium and they are at the bottom of the stairs looking up. So the man has to learn that he needs to be easily approached. Just like it says in James 3.17. In James 3 and verse 17, it says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and, and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So you, you need to be easy to be entreated. It should be easy for somebody to come talk to you. It should be easy for somebody to come and ask you a question. The young Bible believer may spend many hours so winning going out to those who have no use for what he even has to say, which is obviously a needful thing to do. But many times the motive is to boost the attendance and fulfill the fantasy that he has for his church, but he neglects the sheep who are reaching out to him. And it seems to me it would be easier to help somebody who's reaching out to you and wants your help than somebody who's not reaching out to you and doesn't want your help. And the, the guy begins to mystify himself to the people with over-exaggerated stories and illustrations about himself that develop into outright lies over time and it just be and he makes him seem to be like a little mini god he gets conceited in his calling and cocky with his doctrines puffed up in his knowledge and I'm I'm not saying necessarily the guy in 1 Kings 13 is like this I'm just kind of using him as an example of somebody that this could happen to so he gets puffed up in his knowledge and 
then the young Bible believer gets poor in his consistency. Now let's read 1 Kings 13 again. 1 Kings 13, verse 4. It says, And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the men of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. So you see, King Jeroboam's like, Get a hold of this young prophet here. And as soon as he stuck out his hand, it dried up. King Jeroboam's hand dried up, so that he couldn't pull it back into him again. And it said, The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the men of God had given by the word of the Lord. You see, he really was a man of God. He really was a prophet. He really did have the signs of the Lord, the signs that God gives to prove that the man is from God. So he did have it. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and it became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. So, <clears throat> you see, uh, the wicked king Jeroboam, now he wanted the young man's help, because he's in that situation. So he knows the right person to go to. But watch what happens. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn, turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. And Jeroboam, it seemed like he got right with the Lord there, but if you keep reading, he never got right with God. He, it was just, he was only wanting to go the Lord's way so he could get his hand fixed. And the young prophet, he did get the man's hand fixed. But you see how, how good the young prophet did there, but he's poor in his consistent, consistency. You see, that whole story there, he was confident enough to take on the king. He was confident enough to take on the Antichrist. This young prophet, he had a lot of guts. He, he did so good here in the first part of the chapter. He had a lot of guts. And most young Bible believers do. They got the boldness of the word. He's confident in the word of the Lord to the point that he confronts King Jeroboam, this industrious character, this mighty man of valor, as it calls him in 1 Kings eleven twenty eight, 28. And to top it off, King Jeroboam is the king. He's the man. And this young prophet, this young, the young man of God is confident enough to take him on. King Jeroboam is a type of the Antichrist. There's eight to, at least 18 types of Antichrist in the Old Testament. Jeroboam's one of them. And when a young King James Bible believer is confident enough and has a lot of zeal, confident enough to take on the Antichrist, but they're poor in their consistency. But here are some ways Jeroboam is a type of the Antichrist. Number one, he persuades using convenience. In 1 Kings 12, 28, he persuades with convenience. That's exactly what the Antichrist does in Revelation 13, 17. He's going to make it very convenient for you to buy and sell. If you take his mark. The next thing. He promotes gods of gold. Jeroboam does that in 1 Kings 12, 28. And you see that people are still having gods of gold in the, in the tribulation. Revelation 9, 20. Number three. His priests are for devils. You see that in 2 Chronicles eleven fifteen, Jeroboam has priests ordained for the devils. And in Revelation 17, 3 through 5, you see that the Antichrist is connected with devils. And 
connected with the great whore, Mystery Babylon, who is the, the cage of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Number four, he partakes in signs. In 1 Kings 13, 3, and you see the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Number five, he pushes new times and laws. In 1 Kings 12, 32 through 33, which is exactly what the Antichrist does in Daniel 7, 25. <clears throat> Number five, his prophets are against him. In 1 Kings 13, 2. And Revelation 11, 7, you see the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, are against the Antichrist. Next, he is past feeling. You see that in 1 Kings 13, 4 and 1 Kings 13, 33. And you see that about the Antichrist in Daniel 11, 37. He's past feeling. The next way he pictures the Antichrist is the prophecy of the dried up arm. You saw that the king's arm got dried up in 1 Kings 13, 4. Exactly what happens to the Antichrist in Zechariah eleven seventeen. Next, he is a pretender along with his wife. You see that in 1 Kings 13, 6. In 1 Kings 14, 2, just like the Antichrist, in Daniel eleven twenty one, 21, he comes in peaceably. He obtains the kingdom by flatteries. He pretends to be a good guy, just like his wife does. Revelation 17 and 18, Mystery Babylon the Great, the great whore. Next, he provo provokes God to anger. 1 Kings 14, 9. The Antichrist also does that. You see that with 2 Thessalonians 1.8 and 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Next, he pressures men to sin. That's 1 Kings 14.16. And for the Antichrist, Revelation 13.12 through 15. Next, pay attention to the 13s associated with Jeroboam, just like the Antichrist is associated with 13s. 1 Kings 13 talks about Jeroboam. 2 Chronicles 13 talks about Jeroboam. Revelation 13 talks about the Antichrist. Next, he pushed away a faithful remnant in 2 Chronicles 11, 13 through 17, which is what the Antichrist does. See Mark 13, 14. So there's 13 reasons how Jeroboam pictures the Antichrist. The young man of God was confident enough to take on the Antichrist, to take on a picture of the Antichrist. But he was poor in his consistency because he's constantly giving in to the lust of the flesh. The prophet was given clear instructions not to eat bread or to drink water in this place. And when Jeroboam offers to refresh him with food and drink, you saw he turned it down, and he did good. But then when his flesh got hungry, he took an offer by the old prophet to come home with him, to eat bread and to drink water. Let's look at that, First Kings 13. In First Kings 13, 11, it says, Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. So you got this old preacher, and he hears about this young preacher, and he comes to him, and he's going to get him all messed up. So his sons told him all about this young guy, and the words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, what way went he? For his sons had seen what way the men of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode their own. And went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me, and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. 
For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. So you see, he's going by the scripture here. He's going by the word of the Lord. He's got the truth. He knows the truth. And he didn't let the king get in his way of obeying the truth. So why should he let this old prophet get in the way of him obeying the truth? Look what the old man of God said. He said unto him, in verse 18, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Obviously, he lied to him because he's telling him something different than God told him. When somebody's telling you something different than the Bible told you, it doesn't matter if they claim an angel told them. It doesn't matter if they claim God told them. If they're telling you something different than what God told you through the scriptures, then you know that they're lying. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter how old they are. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandments which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread, and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come into the sepulchre of thy fathers. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass, to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. So you see that? <clears throat> he was confident enough to take on the Antichrist, but he constantly gives in to the lust of the flesh. That's just like many Bible believers. The prophet was given clear instructions not to eat bread or to drink water in this place. When Jeroboam offered to refresh him with food and drink, he turned it down. Then when his flesh got hungry, he took an offer from the old prophet to come home with him and to eat bread and drink water. And as novices in spiritual warfare, the young preacher will constantly give in to his fleshy appetites. One minute he's preaching against everything and calling himself Antipas, the faithful martyr. And the next week he's flirting with a girl at work or cussing a co-worker or having a drink. But consistency and holy living is key. Just like Paul said in Titus 3.8, maintain good works. You know, don't just be confident enough to take on the baddest guy around one day, but then constantly living for the flesh the next day. So, the young Bible believer is in danger of being puffed up in his knowledge. He's in danger of being poor in his consistency. He's in danger of being prone to blindly follow the old preacher, just like this young prophet did in 1 Kings 13, 11 through 22. You see, with young Bible believers, they're prone to blindly follow the old preacher. Concerning what God said. We know that the young prophet knew what God said. He proclaimed what God said twice to Jeroboam and to the old prophet. However, he let the old man of God override what God initially told him. In 1 Kings thirteen eighteen, it says, He said unto him, I am a prophet as thou art, and an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house that he may eat bread and drink water, but he lied unto him. So he let that old prophet override what God initially told him. Many times a young Bible believer believes the Bible to the extent, he believes it to the extent if, that it lines up with his mentor or his favorite preacher or pastor. But once it disagrees with them, they take the the view of the, the older older man in their life instead of taking the view of the scripture. We need 
We all need a pastor. We all need a teacher. We all need a good man to follow. We need a multitude of counselors, as it talks about in Proverbs 24, 6. However, with all these men, you must filter all their words through the scriptures and then let God be true, but every man a liar, Romans 3, 4. So a young Bible believer forgets that his favorite pastor is also a sinner and still has an old nature, and we shouldn't blindly follow the old preacher, especially concerning what God said. And we should not carelessly eat whatever he dishes out. In 1 Kings thirteen nineteen, it shows the young prophet took the old man of God's word. He took his word for it and ate everything that he threw on the table. He went back and he ate his food. He drank his water. He ate everything that he dished out. The young Bible believer was so impressed by the old preacher that he let the old preacher override the scriptures. Today, the trouble is that the most, most preaching, it just makes people impressed with the man preaching and not in the man Christ Jesus. They're, they don't leave any more impressed with Jesus Christ and the scriptures they left impressed with the man preaching. It makes them impressed with the man's mystified stories and not the scriptures. And Second Timothy 4.4 4 just talks about fables that people bring. In Second Timothy 4 and verse 4, it says, And they shall turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. What you're hearing a lot of today is just a guy getting up saying a bunch of fables. And it makes... The people impressed with the man preaching, not with the scriptures and the Lord Jesus Christ. The young Bible believer will imitate his mentor. He will be so impressed with what he puts out that he eats it all up, the bones and the chicken. And you see in certain crowds, they'll imitate a man's voice fluctuation, his filler words, his hand mannerisms, the way he dresses, the way he cuts his hair, until they become a clone. And just like just like Paul talks about to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 3, 4, what, what is he talking about that they're saying? The Corinthians were saying, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. He says, Are you not carnal? Why are you saying, I'm of this guy or that guy? We are all... If you're saved, we are of the Lord. The Lord is our example. Now, we should follow men who have Jesus Christ as our example. But when it comes right down to it, Jesus Christ is the man. It's about the man Christ Jesus. Not this man over here that's a sinner too. So the young Bible believer will idolize his mentor. He will be a Bible believer as long as the Bible lines up with his favorite pastor or teacher. And the old preacher could make himself appear as a little mini-god or the fourth part of the Trinity to this impressionable young novice Bible believer by using over-exaggerated stories. Or many times he has great experience in resting the scriptures. Just like this old man of God came and said, well, I, I just talked to an angel, an angel spake to me and told me that you need to come to my house. You see, many times the old preacher is so good in his bad doctrine that he can easily talk a seasoned Bible believer out of his good doctrine. You see, they know their wrong doctrine better than you know your good doctrine. I mean, you look at certain men that you think that you, like, see a, a young Bible believer, he hears about men like John, somebody like John MacArthur and how John MacArthur is uh, got really bad doctrine and he gets so cocky in his Bible doctrine that he thinks he can take on somebody like John MacArthur. But the thing is, somebody like that knows more about their bad doctrine than you know about your good doctrine. And you're just, <clears throat> you kind of almost get way out of your league in a sense. And you, you're easily talked out. You're easily talked out of what you believe 
because there's a lot of guys that's been involved in their bad doctrine a lot longer than you've been studying your good doctrine. And they easily talk you out of the scriptures because you're looking too much at men and not listening to the word of God. Your only weapon against the old preachers that's been around for a long time that's trying to lead you the wrong way your only weapon is the word of God in prayer approach the scriptures with a believing heart a humble heart knowing that you don't know nothing and if you think you know something then you know nothing yet as you ought to know let the scriptures be your guide and the Lord don't just rely on men to interpret just open the Bible read it and just say that's what it says I believe it. And if you do that, you'll be all right. But you can't just carelessly eat whatever someone dishes out just because they've been at it longer and they're way smarter. And they know more about their doctrine than you know about your doctrine. That's how you'll get deceived is by thinking, well, they're much older and they've been at it longer and they know more. All three of them things may be true. You have to go back to the scriptures. So this young prophet, he, when it, he was poor in his consistency, he got puffed up in his knowledge. He's prone to blindly follow the old preacher, thinking, well, this guy, he's older. He's been at it longer. He's smarter. But he was still wrong. Just like many people that's been around longer, they know more than you, obviously. They're still wrong and they can still give you the wrong advice. You have to filter everything through the scriptures. And the next thing, he's pr prone to blindly follow the old preacher and he's persuaded that the devil is a house cat. Look at 1 Kings 13, 23 through 30. 1 Kings 13, 23 and it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back and when he was gone a lion met him by the way and slew him and his carcass was cast in the way and the ass stood by it the lion also stood by the carcass and behold men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way and the lion standing by the carcass and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt and when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof he said it is the man of god who was disobedient unto the word of the lord this is kind of funny because he's the one that got him to be disobedient therefore the lord hath delivered him unto the lion which hath torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. And he spake to his son, saying, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God, and laid it upon the ass, and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. So you see, he, he was persuaded that the devil was a house cat. Many times, the young Bible believer starts thinking that he's so tough he can take on the devil himself. And in 1 Kings 13, 24, the young prophet who took on a top of the Antichrist at the beginning of the chapter and left victoriously has now run into a picture of the devil, the lion, and meets his demise. So many times you hear of a, a young Bible believer starting out strong for God, but they fall into the condemnation of the devil because they're a novice. First Timothy 3, 6. They get lifted up in pride. They get too cocky. And this leaves them open for an attack. This digs their pit. And it breaks their hedge. You know, in Ecclesiastes 10... Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 8, it says, he that, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. So he, he broke down his hedge. He digged his pit. He digged his pit when he disobeyed what God said and did what the old prophet said. <clears throat> 
You know, a lot of times you you might hear your 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 uh, mentor talk about whooping the devil, but don't be tricked into thinking the devil is a house cat. He's a roaring lion. First Peter five eight, and Michael the archangel didn't bring him a railing accusation in Jude verse nine. A trouble with young Bible believers is that they think they are going to grow up to be an old man of God themselves. They don't realize God doesn't need them. The young prophet died, but God's not in any trouble. He could have he could use the ass that was laying next to his carcass to prophesy if he needs to. Just like he got Balaam's ass to talk. He he doesn't need you. You know, you the he the young prophet was seems that he was persuaded the devil's a house cat. And he got clawed to death in the battle. And his carcass is left for the world to see. In 1 Kings 13, 25, men passed by and saw the carcass in the way. You see, the world loves to see a fallen Bible believer get off into sin. This way they have an alibi for sin themselves, and it gives an occasion to blaspheme. Just like in 2 Samuel 12, 14 with David and his situation. You see, it hurts their testimony. And it causes them not to have a good report of them which are without, as First Timothy three seven talks about. So the trouble with young Bible believers is that they haven't gone through the trials to be humbled. This makes them puffed up. They don't have the spiritual stamina to keep going through trials and temptations, so they lack consistency. They rely on their favorite preachers more than the Bible. And they take too much uh, consideration for what the old preacher says many times to the point that they will use him to override the scriptures. And they're just ignorant of the devil and his devices. And all Bible believers were once young and novices. We all have to start somewhere. And you're in danger of everything in this lesson. Your only weapon and hope is the Lord, the Word of God, prayer, good mentors. But even your mentor's advice must be filtered through the Scriptures or you're going to end up just like the young prophet in 1 Kings 13 who seemingly got a little bit puffed up in his knowledge, who was poor in his consistency, was prone to blindly follow the old preacher and persuaded that the devil was an easy foe. So you don't want to make those mistakes.